Uh, we are we're in a series where we've been talking about angels, and I don't know if there's anybody besides me that has been at least a little bit surprised of how little you knew about angels and their work among us. In fact, I, I'll have to admit that as I've been working through lots of passages, I have been a little bit shocked at how many angels I have discovered that I did not see when I uh, read the passage the first time. It's like, it's like angels are everywhere, y'all. And they are. Serving in an invisible realm that is we can't see, and yet it is as real as anything in this entire universe. And so it's like you can miss them, take them for granted, like you, you can pass right by, and that's exactly how they want it. Uh, they really, it's not about them, it's about Him. And they are always pointing the way back to God and to Jesus Christ who is seated on the throne of heaven. And they want to bring Him praise, continually bring Him praise. So uh, again, for us, uh, that's where we want our attention to. So sometimes it's kind of easy to miss the angels. And yet their work among us that God is deploying them to do is so important. This, this coming back and forth from heaven to earth, uh, carrying out the directives of God on our behalf is, is very powerful and important stuff to us. It says in Hebrews chapter 1, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit Salvation. Those are believers. Those are us. And so the angels are busy and active. They are uh, watching over God's people all the time. They are delivering answers to prayer all the time. They are working to bring comfort and encouragement and wisdom from the Lord to us. And so this business is going on all the time. You might even say angels run the world, right? They are, they're busy everywhere. Um, and what they do affects everything that we do. And so what I want to talk about today, maybe this is the question that some of you have been asking. How do I get those angels to work for me? How do I get some of that angel stuff working in my life. Now, let me just start by saying that angels do not work for you or, or me. They, they work for the Lord. But the Lord has said that He is predisposed to having His leadership and authority be deployed through angelic activity. And so, what I want to talk about today is what I would call the environment of angelic activity. Or we might say, how do I till the soil of my life in such a way that God can work freely and more effectively in my life? Uh, in my life? Therefore, uh, it, will, it will sort of generate or activate angelic activity because they're working for the Lord in my life. So I want to talk about three things today that we can do that seem, according to the scripture, seem to activate angelic activity, activate God moving in really powerful ways in our life. Now, if there were things that, that I can do to generate more God in my life, I want to know them. How about you? Okay, so there are probably lots of them, but I'm going to mention three today. All right, the first one is this. Uh, often God's angelic activity is activated through worship. Through worship. Now, since one of the functions of angels is to worship the Lord continuously, night and day, it only makes sense that when we join angels in what they do best, 
worship that uh, God pays attention and activates them on our behalf. So I want to look at a, a passage today. If you've got your Bible, you might turn with me to Isaiah chapter 6, or you can follow along here on the notes. Uh, some of you are familiar with the sixth chapter of Isaiah, but the background you might not be familiar with. Because what it says, it begins by saying that, that Isaiah went to worship the Lord in the temple on a day with a very, where he had a very heavy heart. He, he was sad, and yet he still went to worship. It says that King Uzziah had died. And uh, King Uzziah had served the nation, God's people, for 52 years. Now, can you imagine someone, for 52 years, they've, they've been the king. Uh, for most people, that's all they've ever known. It'd be like Queen Elizabeth. No one else has ever reigned in my lifetime. What do we do from this point? And so... Uh, King Uzziah was, was also not just someone who had been in charge for 52 years. He'd been a good king. He had, he had risen the level of, um, I, I guess, uh, honor and glory uh, to God by what he had done. He had, he had really increased uh, the nation. And they were, they, were, they were the envy of other nations. And so... When he died, it was a national tragedy. It was also a personal tragedy to Isaiah. And so Isaiah, it says, I went to worship, and this was the context of the worship. Uh, King Uzziah had, had died. And he said that he went into the earthly temple, and something happened as he did on that day. He was sort of transported to the heavenly temple. He was transported to heaven, and this is what he saw. God showed him quite a sight. He says, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings, with Two, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth, the whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and the threshold shook. And the temple was filled with smoke. He says... I, I got this most amazing picture. He says, I saw the Lord himself. He was exactly where he ought to be. He was seated on the throne of heaven. And it says, and his presence filled the whole space. It says the train of his robe. But if you could just imagine there, that everything there, he said, as I was in his presence, was filled by the presence of the Lord. And he says, and all around him, there were seraphs. These are angels, six-winged angels. And they are, they are praising him. And they are, they are in worship all around him. It says, with, with two of their wings, they covered their face because they could not look on the splendor of his glory. And even though they're supernatural beings, it says he was so much more glorious they covered their faces it says they covered their feet because it was like they, they felt naked in front of him as they were exposed to his purity and his love and his 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 holiness and they probably didn't want to step on the train of his robe and then it says that they had wings that they were flying these other two wings they were flying so they were ready at a moment's notice to be deployed on his behalf. And they, that's, that, that's what Isaiah is seeing. And he says, and they were singing. 
They were saying to themselves, but I, I believe they were singing to each other. And they, it, it, apparently they were singing antiphonally, which is, there are two groups of them. And they're calling back and forth. They're singing back and forth to each other. One group is saying, holy, 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 which is, God is so incredibly set apart and wonderful and other than. He is, he is beyond any word that we can say. And then the other group is saying, yeah, the whole earth is full of his glory. Everywhere you look, he is involved in his creation. He's everywhere. If you open your eyes, you can see him. And they're calling back and forth to each other. I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a sanctuary, church sanctuary, where they have something called a split chancel. So not a central pulpit in the middle, but they sort of have two lecterns or two pulpits on the side. There's an altar in the back, and then there's two speaking podiums, and then there are two choir lofts. There, there's, there's one on each side, and you go, why would they build it that way? Why wouldn't they put the whole choir together? Well, it's, it's based on what they see here in Isaiah 6. They, they're going to call, they're going to sing back and forth to each other on two sides, calling back and forth. It's like the hallelujah chorus, if you've you remember some of the words. Uh, one group says, King of kings. And another group says, Forever and ever. And Lord of lords. And then they go, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. And they go back and forth. Well, that's what, that's what Isaiah is seeing. And he's blown away. As he should have been. He says, I saw the Lord. This was the Lord there in front of me. And he was high and lifted up. And it was amazing. He says, I, I, was, I was completely blown away. And I think this is probably what he saw. Is that he went to worship sad. Because the king was dead. Now he's standing in the presence of God. And he realized, realizes that the king, the real king, is very much alive. Changes everything. Which brings me to the spiritual principle for this, this first thing that we can do to talk about worship is that the way I view everything will change once I get a true picture of the one true and living God. Once I get a picture of God, the way I see everything changes. And hasn't that happened to you? Haven't you come to worship before and you didn't feel like coming? <laughs> you got up anyway, or it was raining, or you didn't feel good. You go, well, I'm going to go anyway. And then when you left, you said, man, I'm glad I came to worship. Or you walked in here discouraged. And then after you had a chance to praise and be in the presence of other believers and the Holy Spirit moved in your heart, you left and you were encouraged. Or your world was falling apart when you came in and then you heard something and you said, you know what, I've got hope. That's what worship can do to someone. It can, it can change the way they see things. Now, notice... Something else here about worship as Isaiah saw it. And by the way, if you're someone that likes quiet worship music, don't be offended, but I don't believe it was very quiet in that place. Because it says the doorposts were shaking. I mean, it was, it was rocking in that place. They were, they were chanting back and forth, and it was intense. And there was smoke everywhere because it was coming off of the altar of incense, and it was, it was swirling around with beautiful smell, and it was an amazing experience. And, and that's when Isaiah fell to his face, and it was... He couldn't think of anything to say except this. He says, woe to me. I am ruined. I, 
I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. He said, I'm ruined. Look at me. You know, when, when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, and you look at yourself, you might not like it exactly like you see it. You might have to paint it up a little bit, and, you know, fix your hair. But normally, when you leave, you go, okay, I think I look good enough to be presentable. You know, when, when you appear before the Lord, then all of your flaws, everything that you really are, comes through because of His purity and none of us look very good. And that, that's what Isaiah says. He says, I, I am, I'm ruined. I, I'm, I'm, in a terrible, I'm in a terrible place. And listen, that is the atmosphere that is necessary. That's the environment that God is looking for to move when there is, there is full-blown worship and humility of heart, and you're standing in awe of God, that's when He can release angelic activity into your life. That's when God can answer your prayers. That's when God can move. That's when God has got a real hold on your heart. And that's exactly what happens to Isaiah. It was at that point when he's on his face before God, that the angels moved in his direction. It says, he says, the seraphs came toward me. That must have been scary. And he said that one of them went over onto the altar of incense and he picked up a burning hot coal and he flew toward me. And in my state of feeling broken and sinful and lost, he touched me with that coal. He says, he touched my lips as a symbol of, now your lips are clean. Now your life is clean. Now you're ready to go out on a mission. I'm now preparing you to do great things for me and to work for me, Isaiah. Now you're ready. Now you're ready to go. Now, I, I just want to pause right there because... I think for a lot of us, um, our mind is so, we're so focused on other things that a lot of times we, we can't concentrate on worship. We, we are so focused on our circumstances that we do not get a real good picture of who God is. Uh, sometimes, we again, we, we don't feel like worship, or we, we say, you know, worship won't do any good today, I'm not, in a good, I'm not in a good place. That is the time you need to go worship. That is the time when you need to fall on your face. That is the time when you need to say, I am ruined, I am helpless without you. You are so holy, and yet you are so involved in my life. Now do it again. And I, I worship you and I praise you with all I've got. And that is when God will move in your life. How about a second one? Again, often God's angelic activity is activated through sacrifice. Through sacrifice. Now let me define sacrifice. Sacrifice is taking something of value to you and giving it to God. Okay, so sacrifice is, <clears throat> it's a tangible way of saying, Lord, I'm serious. I'm, I, I am seri I'm in serious need of your help and your presence in my life. I need for you to, I need for you to activate some answers. You know, I, I need for you to pour out your, your presence in a, in a powerful way, and, and I need you to do it, I need you to do it now, you know, and I'm, I'm desperate for you. You know, 
In the Old Testament, a sacrifice was when you came and you brought your best and you gave it to God. So a lot of times it was your best animal from your flocks or your herds. It was the first and best part of your olive crop or your, uh, your grain crop. And it was brought and it was given to the Lord and it was, it was a sacrifice. Sometimes it was, Lord, I'm sacrificing because of my sin. Other times it was a, it was a fellowship offering or it was a, it was a thank offering. Lord, I'm giving this to you because I want what you have for me more than what I have for me. And, and that is what a sacrifice is. I'm willing to give you what I think I want most because I want what you have for me more than what I have for me. So let's look at Genesis chapter 22. Some of you know in Genesis 22 is the story of Abraham and Isaac. And the back story of Genesis 22 goes all the way back probably to Genesis 12 and to Genesis 15. Uh, Abraham and his wife could not have children. And they tried and for years they were unsuccessful. And then they moved into what we would call out of the childbearing years. And yet God spoke to Abraham and made him a promise that his descendants were going to uh, be as numerous as the stars in the sky. And descendants means you've got to have children to be, able to, to be able to have any people following you. And so God said, the day will come when you have a son. And sure enough, it took a bunch of years, but eventually Abraham and Sarah had we're given a, a son by God. And don't you know, if you've got to wait 25 years for that to come, that you were in love with that child. They, Abraham loved Isaac, especially because they couldn't have any more children. This is the only one. And then one day, God said to Abraham, I want you to go to a certain place. I want you to build an altar and I want you to sacrifice that son to me. Now, I, and I'll just say that that is that was a strange request by God, and very much out of character with what God would ask someone to do. And yet, the very next morning, Abraham got up, he cut some wood, he prepared his donkey, and he and Isaac and two of his servants left and headed toward the mountain where God told them to go. They did it. I'm sure it, was, I'm sure it was hard, but they did it. And he took off and they started headed toward the mountain, heading toward the mountain. And Isaac uh, is, is, a, is not a little boy anymore. He's a he's, he's teenager. And he looks around and he says, Father, you know, I, I see the wood... I see the fire. I just don't see the lamb. I don't see the sacrifice. Did we forget the sacrifice? He didn't realize he was the sacrifice. And this is what Abraham says. He says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then it says, and the two of them went on together. Now here's the spiritual principle. The answers I need are already there, waiting for the right time for God to release them to me. You remember we talked last week that Daniel prayed for 21 days, but on day one, God heard him. So God hears our prayers, he knows what we need, and he's just waiting for the right environment to be able to release them to us. Now, I want God to go ahead and release them on day one. How about you? You know, I like answers right now. That is not what happened with Abraham. Uh, God did not speak to Abraham on the day that he left for this journey. 
No answers on day one. He didn't speak to him on the way. He didn't give him an answer along the way. He didn't give him an answer when he got to the base of the mountain. He didn't give him an answer. He didn't speak to him when he was building the altar. He didn't answer Abraham until Abraham tied his son up, put him up on the altar, and took out the knife. And then it says God sent the angel of the Lord. And he said, do not lay a a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Which, that ram had to be the quietest ram ever, all right? Because no one saw him until he got ready to plunge the knife into his own son. And listen, y'all, this is the way, often the way God works. He wonders, are we serious? Or or, do you really need my help? Are you, are you willing to give up something of lesser value, valuable to you, in order to get something that is far more valuable from me that I can give you still? You know, you call it a test. Often it's, it's a test. But it, it seems to motivate God's heart and activate His commands and His directives Like nothing else, a sacrifice. So for instance, when you fast, it is powerful because what you say is, I like food, but I'm willing for a time to set aside that because I want what you have for me more than I want this cheeseburger today. More than I want, more than I want this food, I'm willing to set aside, I need a breakthrough. So I'm willing to sacrifice. It's why giving is such an important sacrificial move on our part. Because often we cry out and say, Lord, don't you see my bank account? Don't you see my finances? Won't you intervene and help me? And yet, I've not been willing to take any of my disposable income and put it at the disposal of God. And so often my giving up front really generates something in God's heart and causes him to give the answers that I need, which have always been there. They've just been kind of stuck waiting on me to trust God and offer him a sacrifice. You know, that's the question for me. Am I willing to give up something of value to me in order to get something far more valuable from God. Often when I do, it activates His directives, His commands, His answers like nothing else. And then one more, and this will be brief. But uh, often, God's angelic activity is activated through prayer. And that should not be surprising to us that God tends to uh, answer, respond to men and women who get on their knees and pour out their hearts in, in prayer. It gets God's attention. You know, when you're in an impossible situation and you, you pour that out in front of the Lord and you say, I'm going to trust you because I'm at my wit's end, uh, it, it moves the heart of God. And I, in just reading Luke chapter 22, you just see it, the, probably the most fervent prayer in the whole Bible is Jesus praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. And most of you know that's when he took you know, Peter, James, and John, and they fell asleep as he went over and prayed. And Luke gives us just the, the barest sketch of what went on there, probably because 
you know, he, he had gotten it secondhand. He was not an eyewitness. This abbreviated version of the Lord Jesus pouring out his heart because what he was getting ready to go through was going to be terrible. I mean, he was going to be betrayed by friends, deserted by trusted, loyal people that had been with him for years. He was going to be beaten. He was going to be tried, lied about, struck, and eventually crucified. The worst kind of death. And some people say, well, he was God, so it really it wasn't that big a deal to him. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, it was. Uh, Jesus was never not God, and yet he set aside, it says he's, the Bible says he set aside his divinity and fully embraced his humanity. And so what he was going to go through was going to be the worst that anyone could dish out to a human being. And this is what he prays. He says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And so he prays two things. He says, Lord, I don't want to go through that. I'm, um, you know, I'm dreading this. In fact, really what Jesus said was, God, I know this has been your eternal plan, but do you mind changing it? <laughs> Would you change it? Because this, we're, we're at the last moment and I just, I don't know that I, I can bear to go through this. And then he said, hey, but if that's not possible, then you know I want what you want more than what I want. And so your will be done. And by the way, that is not a cop-out prayer. Like a lot of times we just say, well, your will be done. It's going to be done whether, it's going to, whether, it, whether I say anything or not. It's not fate. That's not a fate statement. It was a faith statement. I want what you want more than I want what I want. And Lord, I know you always know what is best, and I want what is best, and now I lay myself out in front of you. And this is the principle. Listen, God will either give you what you ask for, or He will give you the strength to deal with the situation. Either way, the answer is yes. I will, I will give you exactly what you need. It's when Jesus got to this point, by the way, that I, something I, I I've read this a hundred times, and I don't know that I I don't know that I I, miss, I missed it. I missed it. It says an angel, of course, an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. You know, when you get to the place where you're desperate enough to get on your face and pour out your heart to God and tell Him exactly how you feel and exactly what you need, not hey Lord bless me today, because by the way. That's what he wants to do in our lives. That's what he's going to do. No, it is, this is what I need you to do. This is, I'm desperate. When you get on your face and you're desperate, something happens that activates God's heart like nothing else. When you pour out your heart. It's not just an exercise. It's, a, it's an environment. It's an attitude of your heart that changes everything. And I believe that activates God to say, hey, I'm sending answers. Go, go to his angels. Those, those are my attempts to get us to the place where we begin to think about it. It really starts with us. It starts with our hearts. It starts with us. We can put ourselves in a place where God can work more effectively because the answers are already there y'all he's ready to deploy them but is there the soil in our hearts that make it ready to go now today uh, I'm going to I'm going to say when we're when we're worshiping together in Washington I would say the same thing maybe you need to come and pray maybe you need to come and pour your heart out to God just tell him exactly where you are. Uh, maybe as I've been talking, you've been thinking about, you know, what is it that I, I hold back that I'd be willing to offer because I need, I, I need a breakthrough in my life. Maybe a sacrifice. 
But I know one thing that we can do. We can worship. Because we're here. We're here together that we can worship. And that's how I'd like us to end is by let's shake the foundations a little bit today. Let's, let's tell him how set apart and wonderful he is. Yet he's so, he's so involved in our lives and we need him and we're desperate for him and we love him. And so Lord, would you receive now uh, worship from our lips Would you receive from us the the knowledge of just how awesome we think you are and how how desperate we are for you and and how we, we, as we see you, we see things differently. Lord, open our eyes as we begin to walk out of this place today. We honor you now in Jesus' name. Amen.